address the assembly. Meus cumprimentos. My greetings to the President of the General Assembly, Mr. Yang. I would like to greet the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and each of the heads of state and government and delegates present. I'd like to address specifically to the Palestinian delegation who is taking part in this opening session for the first time a bit as an observer member. I'd like to also uh, mention President Abbas attending this meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, the day before yesterday, here in this very plenary, we adopted the Pact of the, for the Future. Its difficult approval shows the weakening of our collective capacity for negotiation and dialogue. Its limited scope is also an expression of the paradox of our time. We walk around in circles between possible commitments that lead to insufficient results. Not even with the tragedy of COVID-19 were we able to unite around a treaty on pandemics at the World Health Organization. We need to go much further and provide the UN with the necessary means to face the dizzying changes in the international panorama. We are living in a time of growing anguish, frustration, tension, and fear. We are witnessing an alarming escalation of geopolitical disputes and strategic rivalries. 2023 holds the sad record of the highest number of conflicts since World War II. Global military spending grew for the ninth consecutive year and reached $2.4 trillion. Over $90 billion have been mobilized with nuclear arsenals. These resources could have been used to finance the, right, the fight against hunger and climate change. What we are seeing is an increase in military capabilities. The use of force not supported by international law is becoming the rule. We are witnessing two simultaneous conflicts with the potential to become widespread conflagrations. In Ukraine, with regret, we are seeing the war extending without any prospect of peace. Brazil has firmly condemned the invasion of the Ukrainian territory. It is already clear that neither side will be able to achieve all their objectives through military means. The use of increasingly destructive weapons brings to the mind the darkest days of their sterile Cold War confrontation. Creating conditions for resuming direct dialogue between the parties is crucial at this time. This is a message of the six points of understanding that China and Brazil offer for a process of dialogue to be established and, the, and for the hostilities to end. In Gaza and the West Bank, we are witnessing one of the greatest humanitarian crises in recent history, which is now spreading dangerously to Lebanon. What began as a terrorist action by fanatics against innocent Israeli civilians has become a collective punishment for the entire Palestinian people. They have been over 40,000 fatal victims, mostly women and children. The right to defense has become the right to vengeance, which prevents an agreement for the release of hostages and postpones the ceasefire. Forgotten conflicts in Sudan and Yemen are causing excruciating suffering to nearly 30 million people. This year, the number of people in need of humanitarian aid in the world will reach 300 million. In times of increasing polarization, expressions such as deglobalization and decoupling have become commonplace, but it is impossible to deplanetize our life together. We're doomed to climate change interdependence. 
The planet is no longer waiting to demand payment for the next generation and is fed up with unfulfilled climate agreements. It is tired of neglected carbon reduction targets and financial aid to poor countries that does not arrive. Denialism succumbs to evidence of global warming. 2024 is on track to be the hottest year in modern history. Hurricanes in the Caribbean, typhoons in Asia, droughts and floods in Africa, torrential rains in Europe leave a trail of death and destruction. In the south of Brazil, we had the biggest flood since 1941. The Amazon is experiencing the worst drought in 45 years. The forest fires have spread across the country and have already devoured 5 million hectares in August alone. My government does not outsource responsibility, nor does it abdicate its sovereignty. We have done already a lot, but we know that much more needs to be done. In addition to facing the challenge of climate crisis, we're fighting against those who profit with environmental degradation. We will not tolerate environmental crimes, illegal mining, and organized crime. We reduced the deforestation of the Amazon by 50% in the last year, and we will eradicate it by 2030. It is no longer acceptable to think about solutions for tropical forests without listening to the indigenous peoples, traditional communities, and all those that live in them. Our sustainable development vision is based on the potential of the bioeconomy. Brazil will host COP30 in 2025, convinced that multilateralism is the only way to overcome the climate emergency. Our nationally determined contribution, NDC, will be presented later this year in line with the goal of limiting the increase of the planet's temperature to 1.5 degrees. Brazil stands out as a source of opportunities in this world revolutionized by energy transition. Today, we are one of the countries with the cleanest energy mix 90% of our electricity comes from renewable sources such as biomass, hydroelectrical power, solar power, and wind power. We made the choice for biofuels 50 years ago, long before the discussion about alternative energies gained traction. We are in the forefront of other important niches such as green hydrogen production. It is time to face the debate about the slow pace of the planet's decarbonization and work for an economy less reliant on fossil fuels. Mr. President, Latin America has been experienced since a, sec a second lost decade since 2014. The region's average growth during this period was only just 0.9%, less than half of what was seen in the last decade of the 80s. This combination of low growth and high levels of inequality results in harmful effects on the political landscape. Engulfed by disputes often unrelated to the region, our vocation for cooperation and understanding has been weakened. It is unjustified keeping Cuba on a unilateral list of states that allegedly promote terrorism and also that this is undue, this, in Haiti it's, uh, this uh, it reaches the most vulnerable uh, countries. In Haiti, it's urgent to combine actions to restore public order and promote development. In Brazil, defending democracy implies in permanent action against extremist, messianic, and totalitarian attacks which spread hatred, intolerance, and resentment. It was on its behalf that Brazilians defeated dictators and tyrants who tried to undermine institutions and put them at the service of reactionary interests. Democracy needs to respond to the legitimate aspiration of those who no longer accept hunger, inequality, unemployment, and violence. In a globalized world, it makes no sense to resort to false patriots and isolationists nor is there hope in resorting to ultra-liberal experiments that only worsen the difficulties 
of an impoverished con continent. The future of our region depends, above all, on building a sustainable, efficient, and inclusive state that tackles all forms of discrimination. A, f a future which is not intimidated by individuals, corporations, or digital platforms that consider themselves above the law. Freedom is the first victim of a world with no rules. Essential elements of sovereignty includes the right to prescribe laws, educate disputes, and enforce rules within one's territory, including the digital environment. The state we are building is sensitive to the needs of the most vulnerable without giving up sound macroeconomic foundations. The false opposition between state and market was abandoned by developed nations which returned to practice active industrial policies and strong regulation of the domestic economy. In the area of artificial intelligence, we are experiencing the consolidation of the asymmetries that lead to a true knowledge oligopoly. The unprecedented uh, concentration in the hands of a small number of people and companies based in an even smaller number of countries is advancing. We are interested in, in emancipatory artificial intelligence, which also has the face of the global south and which strengthens cultural diversity, that respects human rights, protects personal data, and promotes information integrity. And above all, that it will be a tool for peace, not for war. We need an intergovernment governance of the artificial intelligence in which all states have a seat. Mr. President, conditions for accessing financial resources remain prohibitive for most low and middle income countries. The debt burden limits fiscal room to invest in health and education, reduce inequalities, and address climate change. African countries borrow at rates up to eight times higher than Germany and four times higher than the United States. It's a Marshall Plan in reverse in which the poorest finance the richest. Without greater participation of the developing countries in the management of the IMF and the World Bank, there will be no effective change. While the sustainable development goals lag behind the world's 150th largest companies had collectively made up to $1. trillion in profits over the last two years. The fortunes of the top five billionaires have more than doubled since the start of this decade, while 60% of humanity has become poor. The super-rich pay proportionally much less tax than the working class. To remedy this anomaly, Brazil has insisted on international cooperation to develop minimum global taxation standards. The data released by FAO two months ago on the state of food insecurity in the world is shocking. The number of people going hungry around the world has increased by more than 152 million since 2019. This means that 9% of the world's population, 733 million people, are undernourished. The problem is severely severe in Africa and Asia, but it also persists in parts of Latin America. Women and girls make up the majority of people facing hunger in the world. Pandemics, armed conflicts, climate events, and agricultural subsidies from rich countries are increasing the scope of this scourge. But hunger is not just the result of external factors. It arises above all from political choices. Today, the world produces more than enough food to eradicate it. What is missing is for conditions to be created so that food may be affordable. This is my government's most urgent commitment and hunger in Brazil as we did in 2014. In 23 alone, we lifted 24 million and 400,000 people out of a condition of severe food insecurity. The Global Alliance Against Hunger and Poverty, which we will launch in Rio de Janeiro in November, 
was born from this political will and this spirit of solidarity. It will be one of the main results of the Brazilian G20 chairmanship and is open to the world. Anyone who wants to join this collective effort is welcome. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, about to turn 80, the United Nations Charter has never undergone comprehensive reform. Only four amendments were passed, all of them between 1965 and 1973. The Charter's current version fails to address some of humanity's most pressing challenges. When the UN was founded, we were 51 countries. We are now 193 countries. Several countries, mainly on the African continent, were under colonial rule when the UN was founded and had no say over its goals and functioning. There is no gender balance in the highest positions. The position of Secretary General has never been held by a woman. We are approaching the end of the first quarter of the 21st century with the United Nations increasingly empty and paralyzed. It is time to react vigorously to this situation, restoring to the organization the prerogatives that derive from its status as a universal forum. One-off adjustments are not enough. We need to think about Review and revising the Charter comprehensively. The reform should include the following goals. Transforming the Economic and Social Council into the main forum for dealing with sustainable development and the fight against climate change with a real capacity to inspire financial institutions. Revitalizing the role of the General Assembly, including in matters of international peace and security. Strengthening of the Peace Building Commission. Reform of the Security Council, focusing on its composition, working methods, and veto powers in order to make it more effective and representative of contemporary realities. Excluding Latin America and Africa from the permanent seats of the EU Security Council is an unacceptable echo of domination practices from the colonial past. I have, n let's promote this discussion in a transparent way. Let's promote this discussion in a transparent way in consultation with the G77, the G20, and the BRICS, in the CARICON, at the UE, and any other spaces that exist. I, do ha I have no illusions about the complexity of a reform like this, which will face crystallized interests in maintaining the status quo. It will require enormous negotiation effort, but that is our responsibility. We cannot wait for another world tragedy like the World War II to only then build a new governance on its rubbles. The will of the majority can persuade those who cling to the raw expression of the mechanisms of power the humanities aspirations equal in this plenary. Here, we engage in the world's big debates. In this forum, we look for answers to the problems inflicted on the world. It is, on, it is up to the General Assembly, the biggest expression of multilateralism, the mission to pave the way for the future. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Federative Republic of Brazil.
peu de checking and treating before. Mm -hmm. Mais je me suis. Euh,